morning, everybody. Morning, morning. Good seeing you all this morning. Uh, it seems like I'm lopsided. I don't know. <laughs> everybody but Ruth and Nancy and I <laughs> are sitting on this side. I, I, I want to share some things with you before I get to my message. Uh, first of all, uh, Steve had his DOT uh, exam this week, and I, I think God is good. Uh, he passed all his physical uh, without any problems with it. But I'm going to tell you what he did. He found out that the doctor who loved horses, in fact, she had her own horses that she took out riding through the, kind of, and the mountains. I guess she has uh, horse pads out there. And so he got off his phone, and rather than the examination, he stayed in the office and showed them the pictures of horses. So he, was, he got them on his side, and they, that he did a Phil Faust. I want you to know that he did a Phil Faust. <laughs> uh, I repent. It. Huh? I repent. <laughs> he, he just repents, right? <laughs> but, I, but I'm really proud of my son for uh, passing that exam. Uh, the second thing I, I want to talk about, uh, I mentioned the wall. I don't know how many of you happen to know that uh, Days Inn in Shelbyville, 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 Shelbyville uh, has offered Steve a complete wall in their lobby that they he can mount his pictures with his name on it. And if they get a chance, they're going to sell the pictures for him. They said, we have the privilege of being able to show those pictures on that wall, which will attract a lot of people from the horse country, the Godown for the Kentucky Derby and things like that, and in turn, they'll sell the pictures, and then Steve will keep replacing them as they sell them. So it's going to be a a win-win situation for both the motel and for Steve. So I think God opened a beautiful door there for, for Steve, and I thank God for that. I'm thinking of the year. Uh, Ruth, you were born in 1965. Okay. Man, I tell you, she's getting old, isn't she? Man, is she getting old. But uh, I, I can remember when she was born. I, we were serving the church in Titusville, Pennsylvania. And uh, the, the church was a small church. In fact, they were smaller than what we are right now when I went there. Uh, we had to build church built up around 80 and out uh, one of the factories in town closed their doors. And then we dropped back down around 2530. But uh, we, we were there for about seven years. And uh, the church asked me to attend a statewide minister's meeting in... Uh, uh, Harrisburg. It wasn't Harrisburg, and I can think of the town. Uh, a little bit south of there. It's Hershey. It was Hershey. I don't remember the top of ours. <laughs> that is in Hershey, Pennsylvania. But it was being sponsored by the Disciples of Christ. And if you happen to know the history of the uh, church, the Disciples of Christ are the liberal element of our movement. Uh, the Alcantara Church is the more radical, the more. Uh, Pharisaical, I guess that I don't like to care for that word. That uh, we we are uh, part of that movement of three strings. I didn't know what to expect. I knew the fellow that was pushing uh, me to go, and I uh, got the church to pay my way. Uh, I was very uh, emphatic in my going, and I, I went with him, by the way, to that meeting. Met some friends there that I didn't know were preaching in Pennsylvania. But they were there. And one of them sat beside me. He was a lot stronger than I was, a lot bigger. He was about six foot six. And I don't know how many times he took me by the shoulders and just held me down my seat because I wanted to jump up and say something. I I I I didn't agree with some of the things that were being said. I don't think the Bible agreed with it either. But the subject where I protested the most was that they minimized the second coming of Christ. The reason why they were saying that when you pass from this life to the next, that that is the second coming of Christ for you. That he wasn't going to return. All things are going to remain as they are now. And he wasn't going to return. I disagree. I think there is not biblical evidence 
in teaching to be able to emphasize that Jesus is coming again. If you look at the tie I have on this morning, it says watch and pray because we know not the hour. And I think we need to be very careful as to what we believe. I want to call attention to Paul as he went about establishing churches. He had finished his first missionary journey and where they went through the Breaches of Galatia and established churches. In the 15th chapter of the book of Acts, you, you will find that there was a problem occurring because of Paul's taking the gospel to the Gentiles. And the uh, apostles and the elders were called a meeting in order to be able to discuss this problem. And Paul and Barnabas went down to Jerusalem to be able to uh, defend what they were doing. Uh, what was the problem was very simple. There was a group of Jews that were just simply saying, you need to become a Jew before you can become a Christian. In other words, you have to be circumcised. If you want to be circumcised, you have to accept the biblical uh, teaching of the sacrificial uh, offerings of the Old Testament. You have to uh, become a Jewish proselyte, and then you can become a Christian. Paul disagreed with that. The gospel was open to the Gentiles as they were. All they needed to do was to accept Jesus Christ and follow the commands of, to, to accept him. And after much discussion, it was decided that Paul's message was right. And they formed a letter, the apostles did, that was signed by the apostles. And gave it to Paul and Barnabas and, uh, for them to carry with them to be able to, to counteract the influence of these Judaizers. Now I'm putting all this in my own words. So after, the, towards the end of the 15th chapter of uh, the book of Acts, uh, Paul and Barnabas decided that they were going to go out and visit the churches once again. And there was a big dispute. They became very upset with each other because Barnabas wanted to take Mark, who deserted them on the first missionary journey. Paul says, no, he left us. I want to take Silas with us. So the end result, God used this dispute in order to be able to divide the two teams to have not, not one missionary journey, but two, Barnabas and uh, Mark and Paul and Silas. And in the 16th chapter of the book of Acts, you'll be seeing that they began. And Paul went up to Galatia, this is the churches they started in Galatia, and Mark and Barnabas went down to Cyprus. Now, I'm not going to read the scripture. I had planned to do it, but my time is long. As they came to Durban, there they found Timothy. They had him circumcised because of the Jews of the area, because the Jews knew that his, Timothy's father was a Greek or a pagan. And then... Timothy went with them, and they tried to go up to Asia, but the Spirit would not let them. That was one to the north. Then they tried to go down to Bithynia, which was to the south. And again, they were a bit prevented by the Spirit. You can read that in the nine verses I have there from the, uh, Acts 16 chapter. And they went on to Troas. And while they were in Troas, Paul had a vision of a man from Macedonia. Now, I, I've been asked several times in my ministry, how did he know he was a man from Macedonia? Speech, the way he was, what he was wearing. Uh, the Spirit wouldn't have let him know it was that there, if they could not tell otherwise. But this man from Macedonia asked Paul and Silas to come over to Macedonia and help them there. So they did. And when they went to Macedonia, the first place they stopped, that was Philippi. And you all would know about the uh, Philippian jailer and his conversion to Christ. Then from Philippi, they were driven out of Philippi and down into the regions of uh, Thessalonica. And they stayed there for a while until the Jews from Thessalonica, uh, Philippi came down and started giving them problems. And then they went down 
uh, to Berea. The Bible said that the Bereans were more noble than, they, than those that were in the uh, Thessalonia because of the fact that they searched the scriptures daily to be sure that what they were saying was true. Then Paul was driven out of uh, Berea, and he came down to Athens, where in the 17th chapter of his sermon on the, on the unknown God. And from there he went over to Corinth, and he stayed in Corinth for a while. Now I am not sure, because I have read different history and different concepts there, when uh, Silas and Timothy came from uh, Thessalonica down to be with Paul. Some say he came to, they came to him when he was in Athens. Others said they came to him when he was in Corinth. I'm not sure which. If they told Paul of the good news that they were having, the good effect they were having up in Thessalonica. And Paul sat down and wrote 1 Thessalonians. They took it back. Paul, uh, Silas, and Timothy took it back to him. And then there was some misunderstanding, so Paul, Timothy, and Silas came back to Paul, told him about the misunderstanding. He wrote 2 Thessalonians to correct misunderstandings. Well, there doesn't seem to be any real problems that Paul was addressing. The main theme of 1 Thessalonians and 2 Thessalonians seems to be the second coming of Christ. Over and over and over again, Paul makes mention of the second coming of Christ in his message. Now, some believe that Thessalonians, both letters of the Thessalonians to the Thessalonians, happen to be the first epistles that were written in the New Testament. I, I'm not one of them. I'm, I'm an oddball. I believe that Galatians was. And if you want me to discuss the reason why I believe that Galatians was the first, I'll, I'll explain to you later on. But regardless, this is one of the earliest epistles that we have in God's Word, New Testament, dealing with Christian living. Now, I'm going to make a statement. I'm going to prove it in just a minute. Every chapter, and by the way, the chapter and verses are man-made. They're not biblical. But every chapter in these letters, there is a statement made either in inference or actual about the second coming of Christ. And when we put all these things together, we can begin to understand and get away from some of the traditions and some of the things that are being taught today. And I think we need to do that as far as the second coming of Christ is concerned. Oh, I, 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 sometimes I feel I take my shoe off and throw it at the television when I listen to some of these preachers talk about the second coming of Christ. Uh, Jack and an envy gets me mad every time I hear him. says that God loves the Jew and he's going to give the Jews a new name, Israel, a new name. I agree with that. We are spiritual Israel and that new name was Christian. And I don't feel that the Bible exalts Christianity. I mean, Israel, the Israel, the Jewish religion, Judaism. And I think we need to understand the scriptures in the light in which they were written. Now I'd like for us to just look quickly, and I only have about 10, 15 minutes for this. I'm going to go through the eight chapters of the uh, book of uh, Thessalonians, 1st and 2nd Thessalonians. Pick out the verses that deal with the second coming of Christ and briefly talk about each. So actually you're going to see I have eight, eight points in my sermon. Eight points in 15 minutes, it gives me about a minute and a half for each one. Let's begin. First Thessalonians, the first chapter, the ninth verse. For they themselves show us what manner of memory we in we have unto you, and how you turn to God from idols to serve the living and true God, and to wait for, for his Son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, even Jesus, which delivered us from the wrath of God. Here, see, the emphasis that we are to wait for Jesus Christ. 
And while we do so, we serve the living God. We give Him our all. And then we uh, give ourselves, uh, keep ourselves from the wrath to come. So that's the point I want to make there. Now I'm going to go on real quick. In 1 Thessalonians, the second chapter, verses 19 through 20, we see hope identified with the second coming of Christ. For what is our hope, our joy, our crown of joy? Are not even ye in the presence of the Lord Jesus Christ at his coming? For ye are in glory and joy. I can, I can remember coming down to Huntington area to begin serving the churches around this area. It was the Farmdale Church of Christ that called me down. There was a man there coming to church every Sunday. A good man, very hard worker. As far as uh, his job was concerned. But he wasn't a Christian. And what, one day I was talking to some of the elders and I said, what isn't that man a Christian? And I said, he attends, he, uh, he, he reads his Bible, he prays, he knows. They said, well, you talk to him and find that out. I did. The man's name, by something you might name know, was the Curtin Messer. A good man, a good friend of mine. I don't know whether he's still living or not, but, uh, but he was still a good friend at the time. And he told me, he says, I just won't do it. And I found out when I talked to him that some of the greatest evangelists of our brotherhood had talked to him. And he just laughs at them and shakes his head and says, no way, no way. We were planning revival with a friend of mine by the name of Ray Bass. Ray wanted to come down for a week before and have a week of calling and then we would have a week of the preaching. And then the elders agreed. <clears throat> the one night we would have him calling with yeah, one of the elders came to me and says, Phil, I wanted to not see Kurt. He's just on my heart. I said, okay, I'll go with you. So he went, we went down, we were talking to Kurt. And I said, Kurt, you know why we're here? He said, yeah. He said, I'm going to tell you no, like I always did. And as we talked, the very first thing he said, he says, I don't believe in being baptized in still water. He has to be running water. And I looked at him and said, Kurt, this is the night then. He was kind of fun. I said, this morning I emptied the baptistry so I can clean it out for the revival. There's actually no water in the baptistry, so we're going to have to go to a running stream in order to baptize you. If you're going to be, kind of be baptized tonight, you're going to be, uh, baptized. <laughs> and he kept very stringent. I'm not going to do it. I'm not going to do it. So I looked at his wife. I said, what about your son? He's not a Christian either. He was about 16, 17 years of age. So she says, well, I'll go up and ask her. I'm, I'm chuckling up, by the way, because I remember her so well. And she came down and says, Phil, he said he wants to be baptized at the same time as that is. I looked at Kurt. I said, Kurt, you have two souls to worry about now. You have your soul and you have your son. What are you going to do? His response was at the very moment, what are we waiting for? Let's go. We drove out to Houseville's Christian Assembly, got the law of car lights as close as we could to the baptismal area there, turned the car lights on, said we would have lights, but it was a dark night. The river was swollen. And I waited out in the river, and we baptized Kirk Messer and his son. I remember what that owner told me. He says, Phil, there's a star in your crown because you want into Christ. I think that when Jesus comes back again, there's going to be people there who led me to Christ. You are our joy. You are our happiness. You're our hope. And I think that would be a tremendous experience. 
In 1 Thessalonians, the third chapter, 13th verse. To them that he may establish your hearts unblameable in holiness before God, even our Father, at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ with his saints. Holiness. How are we to live? How are we to behave ourselves? We are to live holy because God is holy. In 1 Thessalonians, the fourth chapter, verses 13 through 18, we find comfort. There's a passage of scripture that is read at every uh, uh, funeral service I think I've ever been at. And I do. But they hear the voice from heaven, the ark, the sound of the ark, archangel, and the trumpet of God, and uh, the dead of Christ shall rise, and we which are alive shall be caught up together with him in the sky. Oh, what a time that's going to be. And Paul ends that his word says, Wherefore comfort one another with these words. And by the way, People that believe in the rapture of the church occurring at a different time than the second coming of Christ, and I don't, would use this passage to say that this is the rapture of the church, not the resurrection. It's not the resurrection. I see it right there. We which are alive shall be caught up together with them that are dead, and they shall be caught up out of our sleep. There is no mention of more than one resurrection in this particular passage of Scripture. They're reading into it. There's no mention of a future millennium. They're reading into it. In the fifth chapter of the first Thessalonians, he's going to come quickly. He's going to come as a thief of the night. And we need to live a prepared life. Now we jump quickly to the uh, second Thessalonians. First Thessalonians, the first chapter. Second Thessalonians, the first chapter. Talks about that God is going to come back in flaming fire. Jesus is coming back in flaming fire to take vengeance on those that know not God and have, have, and have not obeyed the gospel of Christ. Then it goes down in the 11th verse and he says, We pray always for you that God of God will come to you worthy of this calling, fulfill the good pleasure and the work of the power, that the name of the Lord Jesus may be glorified in you according to his grace. That's cool. I, I don't want to uh, keep you here long. Not necessary. Second Thessalonians, the second chapter, one through four. Brother, I, 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 this passage of scripture is overlooked by so many. All my life, I have heard that the early Christians believed that Jesus was Christ was going to come back in their lifetime. Have you ever heard that? That the early Christians believed that that the coming of Christ would be as in their life that they would see it. In fact, that's what the Thessalonians believed. And that is what Paul says. If Jesus is not coming back again until the man of sin is revealed. Now, I'm not, I don't know whether he's been revealed or not. He might be yet to come. Some people believe that. And some people believe that it was the Roman Catholic Church. <laughs> I want to share this with you, and I apologize if I have been paying some sense of this. I, when I work with DirecTV, there was a preacher there. <clears throat> and this is when President Obama was the first elected president. He went around and told everybody that Obama was the Antichrist. Now, I don't believe that. I don't believe that. I want you to know. I'm just using that as an example. Who is he? I don't know. Is he to be revealed? I, I kind of think so. I don't think he's been revealed yet. I think we will know it when he is revealed. And the very last, in 2 Thessalonians, the third chapter, verses 3 through 5, we need to realize that no matter what happens, no matter what occurs, he is with us. He will give us strength. He will help prepare us for the coming of Christ. I don't know how many of you have ever realized that I have a tooth missing in the front of my mouth. I don't know if I've ever told this story here or not. But I, I can remember how I lost that tooth. My brother and I were doing dishes, which was our chore to do. And we will alternate when one day I would wash he would dry. The next day, he would wash and I would dry. And I, I was, just like brothers do, I was washing the dishes. 
He was standing across the room and looking at me. Look at the sissy washing the dishes. Look at the sissy washing the dishes. Of course, I knew it was good nature. So when he started to dry the dishes, I went to where he was standing. And I said, look at the sissy drying the dishes. He picked up a great big coffee mug. And in joking around, he says, here, catch. He cut through it so it would land on the day bed that was behind me. I ducked right into the path of the coffee. When mom got home from work, I talked to mom like this, trying to hide the bad fact. My dad was working in Youngstown, Ohio. His brother got him a job with a company that he worked with. And dad would come home about every other week, maybe three, every three, third week. And when we knew he was coming home, he would sit on the front steps until the bus stopped and let him out. Then my brother and I would race to see who would be the first one to be. That particular weekend, we did not do it. We did. We were afraid of what Dad was going to do. And when he walked in the house, he looked at us and said, okay, what happened? He didn't have to be told. He knew something happened. You know, if we are ready, when that trumpet sounds, it's going to be one of the grandest, glorious times. We're going to see our loved ones have passed away. I'm going to see my wife. I'm going to see my brother. My mother and dad, Vera's mother and dad, Vera's family. Five of them have passed on, six of them have passed on. But if we're not ready. We're going to be singing a song of invitation. Jesus is coming again. Whether it's today or a million years from now, we ought to be ready. We ought to be ready. If you're not ready, you can become ready now as we stand.